Good morning, everybody. I am back after being gone a week for vacation, feeling good, excited about our new series on the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, I encourage you to turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 5. This is where we're going to be uh, for the next few weeks and over the next uh, couple of months. We're going to be throughout this entire sermon. So last week, Peyton finished up our series from Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And it's the set of narratives that show forth this progression of sin, rebellion, and really the beastly nature of humanity. We have ruined ourselves, we've ruined each other, and we have ruined God's good world. But God did not give up on us. And he promised that one day he would come and he would reclaim his own and he would bring his king and he would rule over them once again in this upside down kingdom to the nations. Jesus comes here in Matthew chapter 4 in verse 17 and he begins to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this leads to this mountain moment that, that we get to here in chapter 5, where we are given these, the core teachings by Jesus of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, many have tried to look at this really more as a set of, of rules that we live by, these ethical teachings. But when we do that, we, we miss something else that Jesus is doing here that is of the utmost importance, especially in understanding who this Jesus is. We really need to ask two questions as we go throughout this entire sermon. One is, who is Jesus talking to? And the other question is, what is the setting? What is the occasion that all of this is going down? And in order for us to get there, we need to read just a few verses before we enter chapter 5. So in verse 17, that's where he begins preaching. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he comes walking by the Sea of Galilee in verse 18. He sees two brothers, Simon, we call Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They're casting nets into the sea. They are fishermen. And he tells them, come follow me. And they followed him. And he comes to these other two brothers. And they also are fishermen. These are blue collar workers. And he says to them, follow me. And they followed him. And what I want you to see is they're not significant people as far as, uh, you know, the world is concerned. These are just blue collar workers. They work hard every single day. And then he continues on in verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him. I want you to see who it is that comes out to Jesus. Who are these people? These are people who are sick. They are spiritually oppressed. They are people with no control over their bodies. And it says they followed him. How do you think these groups of people, whether it be the blue collar workers or these people who've come out to Jesus, how were they viewed among Roman culture or even among the elite of their own culture? They didn't have a welfare system. They, these, especially the second group of people, these are not the kind of folks you wanted to hire. They lived on the other side of the tracks, as we may say. They lived in the ghettos. They were poor. So then we come to chapter five, verse one, seeing the crowds. Who are the crowds? It's the very people we just talked about. He went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. These disciples are not apostles. Even though, you know, Peter, James, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they're being called to follow him. They're not apostles. That comes chapter 10. A disciple is simply those who are following Jesus. Who are the crowds? 
You know, I appreciate art and I appreciate the various ways and creative ways that artists have expressed themselves to, to bring forth, you know, some kind of message. A couple of years ago, I came familiar with uh, this couple, Tim Noble and Sue Webster. And they take these, these, these objects that look like garbage. Let's just put it for what it is. It just looks like a pile of garbage. And, and, and then, you know, what they do is they flash this light on it and suddenly the shadows become something of meaning and beauty. In, in one, you see this, this garbage is like laid out and then when the light is flipped on, it's, a, it's the city of New York. It's amazing. Others, there's people that are the shadows that are behind it. And the whole element of their art is about surprise. And it's about perception and things that we consider trash that when light is shined on it, we may find true meaning and true beauty in those things. Who are the crowds? These are the hurting people of the day. They're day laborers. They're beggars. They're people who act differently, a little bit odd. They're unimportant trash. No one cares what they think what's happening in Judaism. No one cares what they think about the Roman Empire. But Jesus says these are the very people who are blessed. Now, the idea of blessed in as far as the Jew is concerned comes all the way back into the Old Testament. And it's the idea of being in a right relationship with God and everything that that means. Um, you know, recently I got behind a car, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, and I noticed on the back of, of someone's vehicle it said blessed. Uh, I've heard the saying, too blessed to be stressed for years. You know, this past week, I, Missy and I were able to spend a vacation in a place we never even imagined we would one day be able to spend, much less multiple times. And we consider, and we say this often, we are so blessed to be able to do that. It's just such an amazing place and an opportunity that we have. But that's not the way Jesus is speaking of blessed, because we think of blessed as someone who, you know, good things have happened to them, they've got a job, they've got good health, or what. That's who are the crowds? They are the poor, the sick. They are the people who are handicapped and oppressed and unimportant. Throughout history, man have taken the Beatitudes and they've turned them into these set of virtues that if you do these things, you will be accepted and favored by God. But that's the opposite of what Jesus is doing. The people the world saw as insignificant, useless, weird, and without honor are the very first ones that Jesus calls to the kingdom. It is a place of honor and blessing and of great importance. And we just look at this and we say, this Jesus is amazing. So verse two, he says, it says he opened his mouth and he taught him them. And the very first thing he taught them is blessed are the poor in spirit. These people, these crowds are people who have been beaten down they do not think very highly of themselves, and they certainly do not believe other people think highly of them either. They are poor people. They are overlooked even by their own spiritual community many times. What does Jesus say about them? He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Their lowly condition is the most favorable position that they could be in at that very moment because right now, these are the very people that Jesus is offering the kingdom and its king. They are the most open-minded, ready to receive the help of Jesus because they are in such desperate need. Don't we see this today? Uh, while I was gone on vacation, uh, I read a book. I always try to read something that has to do with the area, you know, whether it's a local author or whether it's some kind of historical something about there. And so I read a book by uh, um, Frederick Douglass. 
He is probably the most um, influential abolitionist of the 1800s. And his very first speech was right there in Nantucket at the Athenaeum. So I read this book about when he was a slave to the point that he, he flees and he becomes a free man and all of these kind of things. And, and one of the things that, and as I've read other books in this era and about slaves is how important spirituals became to the slaves. Here they are, they're dealing with the oppression of their enslavement and these songs gave them a sense of hope. It gave them really a, a way of maintaining their identity while they're being dehumanized and many times even lower than the animals that lived in these very places. They saw Jesus as a way of, of providing freedom to them. One day, they would sing songs like, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Or a song that you may remember just around a campfire is an African-American hymn. Kumbaya, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. They saw God as one who saw them as humans who were made in his image. It was the only place they found real and true value. On the other hand, those who have it all, who are the blessed, we all can, we have to rethink really what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What does it really mean and, and how it challenges us to think about ourselves and, and our value and our jobs and what it is that really is true joy for us and how we treat other people. One of the things in, in Frederick Douglass's book that I found very interesting was he had several masters and overseers and all of those who who proclaimed to be Christians and they, they went to their worship every week and even in their homes they would sing these hymns and prayers and things of that sort. They were the absolute worst masters that he had. In fact, there was one master uh, who became a Christian while he was in his home and, and he had all of this hope that, that he would see uh, this transformation that he had when he came to God and, and surely this man would see that he is a human and, and if he doesn't release them, at least he'll treat them better. And he end, they end up treating him worse. And what happened was they realized the perception that was there. And so they had to prove to these slaves, they were harsher on them to, to help them realize, yes, I'm a Christian, but you're still my property and I'm, you're still gonna be treated a certain way. And it's like, how, how did that happen? You didn't wrestle with this thing. It also blows the doors off the idea that material blessings are a sign of God's approval of the way we live our lives. That was the Jewish thought on on things back in the day, but he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. He then says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now I realize that's all the way up in, in verse six, we're skipping a couple. And the reason is I'm relying heavily on Tim Mackey and a lot of his understandings of the Beatitudes. And he says, you know, for us to really understand what's happening in verses four and five, we really need to take verse six first. You ever been hungry or thirsty, you know? I mean, when you get really hungry or thirsty, you can't get your mind off of it. I mean, I remember as a kid coming in, you know, I was hungry and I'd tell my mom, I'm hungry. And she would say, go outside and play, get your mind, do something to get your mind off of it. Well, that doesn't work, you know? I mean, it can maybe for a little while, but you know, it just kind of sticks with you. Jesus says, those who long for righteousness, they will find satisfaction. Active righteousness, active righteousness. That's what's at stake here. It is a spiritual relationship between two people who love each other and they feel an obligation to one another. It is a word that, that has been used in 
um, in law, uh, in courts of law. For example, if, if your neighbor accuses you of stealing and, and you didn't steal, but you have to go to court and there's all of these witnesses and all the evidence comes out and they determine that you are not, in fact, a person who has stolen from your neighbor, there will be a pronouncement, in some cases, a pronouncement of righteousness. In other words, you have done right by your neighbor. Jesus is saying, blessed is the person who has a longing to see righteousness happen in our world. What does that even mean? It means these are people, they look out and they see the world that is broken uh, and its relationships are broken on every level, whether it be in the family or whether it be, you know, at their jobs or their neighbor or in politics or whether it's uh, nations against nations. And they see all of this and it really bothers them to the core. Jesus says, blessed are those because you notice what God sees. All is not right in the world. But Jesus says the good news is the kingdom and its king has come. And that's where true satisfaction is going to be found in all of these things. So now we back up and we see blessed are those who mourn. Those who mourn are those who see and they are bothered by tragedy and evil and these broken relationships in the world. And they don't try to distract themselves from them. They, they don't try to, um, you know, get away from the pain and the disasters going on. In fact, they internalize it and, and they weep. Jesus says, you are the one with whom God is with because he's bringing righteousness Wrongs will finally be made right. And it's in this kingdom that righteousness will be done. And, 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 um, and you will finally find comfort. He then says, blessed are the meek. The meek are simply people who are not important. These crowds, the people who are following Jesus, they didn't have a high value of themselves. They did not have, uh, they didn't think anyone else had a, had a high value of them either. But Jesus says they're blessed. And the reason they're blessed is because they're seeing this movement that is going across God's creation, that he is going to bring righteousness in the midst of all the wrong and the brokenness in this world. And they're going to be called children of God. They're going to inherit this new world, new creation, new heavens and earth where God will come and he will reign eternally. Blessed are the merciful. Mercy is an act of compassion. It's where you help someone who's hurting. Those following Jesus, they were not leaders in their community. No one's going to come to them for help. In fact, many people look at them and say they're probably asking everybody else for help. And yet by, we see that they grieve by what they're seeing in this world around them, and they do these small acts of mercy when they have the occasion. Jesus says they are blessed because they see the big picture, and they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart has one goal. It's to see God. They don't care about prestige. They don't care about how people see them as being reputable and wealthy through small acts of mercy. And, and by seeing the world the way God sees it, they are closer to the heart of the Messiah that walks before them as anyone else, they will see God in the very face of Jesus. Then he says, blessed are the peacemakers. These are people who grieve when they see two people that they love and they are at odds with one another. And, and they insert themselves into this conflict in order to try to, to bring back this right relationship between the two. Have you ever inserted yourself between two people? It's, it's not an easy thing. In fact, both sides don't want you there. 
and sometimes they get angry at you. And you're over here with one and you're, you're trying to show them, you know, the good and this person over here because you love that person too. And you want them to see, even though they are having some kind of conflict and you go over here and you're doing the same with them and you're saying, listen, you need to see this good in that person. And you may have to tell each one of them, you know, well, maybe you didn't handle this right or, or maybe you're wrong in this. And, and, and you can become the person that that they're both attacking before it's all said and done, but you love them and you love righteousness. And so you're willing to get in the middle in order to bring this peacefulness. And Jesus says, blessed are you as a peacemaker. And then he finally says, blessed are the persecuted. I want to read the latter part of, of this one because there's a couple of verses. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. When you try to do what is right, we've already seen you're going to find that you're going to be persecuted but Jesus says you're blessed. Even though you may not feel it at the moment, you are blessed. So you can be excited. You, you have this, this time with Jesus and he, he's bringing the kingdom to you and, and, and you see this transformation. And maybe the people in your life, they see this major transformation in you and they're not really liking this new person. Uh, or maybe it's, you know, you're excited about telling other people about Jesus and the kingdom that he's offering to all humanity. And they, they don't know you very well. They misunderstand you and, and they see you as someone who's against them, that, you, that you're saying that they're just these terrible people and, and what you're offering them is, is hope and, and forgiveness and, and joy and all of these things. But, you, but you're going to find yourself in this persecution. And he says, but you're blessed. I wonder how many people who are listening in right now and you feel as if you're second rate. Maybe your body isn't working the way a healthy body does. Maybe it's because of age. Maybe there's some kind of disability that you may have in your life. No one, including right here in our own, uh, our own religious community, you've ne we've never even asked you one time what you think about certain things. Or maybe you're that person that you're living paycheck to paycheck. Jesus says, you are the blessed because you understand the value of the upside down kingdom of God. Notice verses three and 10 again, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Both of them have the same. It's the first and the last of the blessings. And, and it's, it's, it's meant to be put in this kind of bookend type of situation. And it's the only ones that did, you have the same results. And what I want you to notice is that it's in the present tense. He doesn't say it will be yours. He says it is yours. The kingdom has already broken into our world with the arrival of Jesus, even though the final fulfillment is on into the future. But he says it is yours now. And for those of you who realize that you still have a lot um, to lose and hearing the message of Jesus, this blessing is going to be a challenge to you. In fact, I can assure you, bl you blessed people who are just like myself, as I talked about in the beginning, we're going to struggle. I guarantee you, every single one of us are going to struggle with what Jesus is going to say in this message. And we're meant to struggle with it. We're meant to wrestle with it in our life and, and to realize that this, this is what it's all about. This is God's kingdom. And if we truly want what all that God has for us, then, then we wrestle with it. Our Jesus, he came from a poor, insignificant family who mourned and they grieved over the state of the world. Jesus longed to see this world set right, and he did these small acts of mercy to the hurting people in which he encountered. He inserted himself into these dangerous situations and people who hated each other, and, and he was persecuted for it, and eventually he was even crucified. Jesus is the perfect embodiment of these blessings, and he died for the kingdom, and he died for us. 
because we have failed. We have failed each other. We have failed God's good world. But he says, I've come to bring you a blessing. I've come to bring you a kingdom and it's king. And it is offered to every single one of us. And to those of you who consider yourself the lowliest of the lows, you can have this, this great sense in knowing that this Jesus, he came to you first and he says, I offer it to you because you know the value. That's the Jesus who has come. And that's the kingdom that he's going to be presenting to us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for allowing us to be here this day. Father, I pray you continue to be with those who are at home and they're struggling. Maybe they're they're fearful of this virus or maybe it's their job and they're not knowing what's happening. Maybe some have been laid off and maybe there's some who aren't sure what's going to happen in the future. And maybe there's just other things, sickness and and so forth. And Father, I just pray that you be with them. And Father, may they realize and and others who feel like they are oppressed and down, help them to realize they are blessed. They're blessed that you come to them, that you love them. And Father, for, for those of us who have received the many worldly blessings that are out out here, help us to continue to wrestle and to do those things and to realize that everything that you're bringing to us is good. It is good. You're trying to bring us back to the very place that we have fallen. So, Father, we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.